So we're in this series, Thrive Over Survive, and we're asking the question, what does it look like to thrive in our life and not just barely get by and not just survive? How do we thrive and experience the abundant life that Jesus came to give us? And one of the greatest ways that you and I can thrive over just barely getting by in life and in faith is when we step into our primary purpose and our primary mission. When you and I choose, when we say, I, I, I want to thrive, and you will thrive when you intentionally influence the world for Jesus. You see, there's nothing more exciting, more thrilling, more exhilarating, more fulfilling than aligning with the heart of God and letting God use you to impact the lives of others that will have an eternal impact. So the question is, what's the heart of God? God tells us, Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, when he says this, the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, Jesus, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus said, I came to search out and seek those who are far from God, who aren't right with God. And of course, the question is, how does God carry that out? How does he carry out this mission to seek and save the lost? Well, he does it through us. See, our primary mission, our primary purpose is, is stated in Matthew 28. Jesus often, we often refer to it as the Great Commission. And Jesus said there to go, everybody say go. Go and make disciples. That word go literally in the, in the Greek means as you are going. The God's word translation, I think, says it best. It says wherever you go, make disciples. In other words, God intends you to be his influence upon the world anywhere and everywhere you go. You're not bound by Sunday like that our mission only happens here. But no, that you and I, we would pursue our mission day in and day out, anywhere our daily lives take us. As we're going, we make, intent, we make disciples that we are intentional it says it this way in Acts chapter 26. It says, I'm, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people. God is using you. God is sending you to reach those who are far from him. So where do we see the heart of God? For those who are far from him. What does it look like to God? Well, Jesus uh, uh, shares these parables, these stories for us on the heart of God, about the heart of God. You see these in Luke chapter 15. And we see there these stories, these parables, and it's the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coins, and the lost sons. And as I'm not going to read the whole passage, but as I read a couple of the verses, I want you to catch some key words as we discover the heart of God. And so in Luke chapter 15, verse 4, it says this. Jesus is telling the story. He says, suppose of you as a hundred sheep and you lose one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after? Everybody say, go after. go after. And go after the lost sheep until he finds it. And then in verse 8, we jump to the parable of, of the woman. And it says, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house? And notice what it says. And search carefully until she finds it. Then you get into this parable of the lost sons. And it says in verse 20, while there's still a lot, while he, meaning the, the prodigal son, was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran, everybody say ran. ran. He ran to his son, threw his arm around him and kissed him. The older brother is a very interesting story. We don't have time to dissect it, but notice what it says about him. The older brother became angry, and notice what he refused to do. He refused to go. He refused to go in. And so what did the father do, the heart of the father? The father went out and pleaded with him. God says that those who have his heart, according to this passage, they go after they search carefully. They run to. They seek after those who are far from God. They intentionally connect their sphere of influence with Jesus. I want you to think about your own conversion to Christ for a moment and when you were born again. So just allow your mind to kind of go back when you came to Christ. 
Nothing is greater or more important than when you moved from death to life. Would you agree with that? That's the most important decision anybody could ever make in their life. One person agrees with that. Do you believe that the most important decision you can make is to move from death to life? Do you agree with that? I get a yes and an amen from the same person. I like it. And I'm sure you want your sphere of influence, especially your family, to have the same rebirth experience. Uh, I connect with uh, David Pepsi somewhat regularly. David and his wife, Christy, and, and their kids are part of the LifePoint family. They moved a couple years ago to Kenya to be missionaries there in Kenya. And uh, he texted me this week, and he said uh, that his son, Blake, accepted Jesus into his heart this Thursday night. And, and that was so incredible. And as he did that, I responded back in text, and I said this, because uh, I said, praise Jesus, Hopes and dreams of parents realized, and of course, the best decision of his life. Congrats. There's nothing more important than giving your life to Jesus. It's the best decision of your life. But here's the challenge as we think about being intentional influencers and sharing the love of God. As we think about that, maybe some of us here feel paralyzed. Or maybe some of you feel a lack of confidence when it comes to sharing Jesus with others. And it's possible that some of you, because of that, you live with a guilt or pressure or maybe even shame knowing that Jesus has called you to go, to share, to seek, to save that which is lost. To reach out to people with the good news of Jesus. And you know, man, I'm not thriving in this area of my life, the area that Jesus has called me to. I'm not influencing my world for Jesus the way God wants me to. And so if that's you and for all of us, I want to help you. I want to empower you. I want to equip you and give you just today a few practical principles to help you with intentionally influencing your sphere of influence for the Lord. And if we will step into this, it will help us thrive in our faith and it will allow God to use us to change the spiritual climate of our community one person at a time. So I want to see this in the story that we learn about in Luke chapter 10. So turn in your Bibles if you have a physical Bible, Luke chapter 10. If you don't have a physical Bible, jump on your phone to the Version Bible app. You can follow along there with us. And in this passage... Jesus is going to share with his disciples and he's going to give them a call and he's going to tell them to go share the good news about the kingdom of God. And I think this is pretty cool because this is like Jesus is giving his disciples practice while he's still there of, of what he's eventually going to tell them in Matthew 28 when he tells them to go make disciples. And I, of course, would have loved to, I wish the gospel writers would have recorded the after conversation, after they did what Jesus said. I would have loved to see the coaching and what happened there. We don't get that, but we do get the, what he told them. And notice what he tells them. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord, referring to Jesus, appointed, everybody say appointed. appointed. He appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Notice the words, go, I am sending you. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. What does it look like to be an intentional influencer for the Lord? It starts with you and I deciding to engage in our primary mission and our primary purpose. Notice again, verse 1, what does it say? Jesus appointed them. Jesus has called us. Jesus intends to save more than just you. I'd like us to think about it this way. And maybe you've never thought about this. But God has given you a unique sphere of influence that's unique to you alone. That there are people you interact with, people you talk with, people that you cross paths with, people that you share life with and you share proximity with. And God wants to use you to be his representative anywhere and everywhere you are with these individuals. He's appointed you to intentionally influence their lives. All we do is we decide to engage. 
And you know what that means? It means that you and I are going to infuse intentionality into whatever our existing rhythm of life is, whatever our existing routines are currently are, that we would be intentional, that we say, I want to be on mission, that day in, day out, I'm going to build relationships and connections with those who don't yet know the Lord. And with our intentionality, God will use us. God will use you. God will use your life. God will use your story to make an eternal difference, to reach somebody for the Lord. So stepping into your primary mission, your primary purpose, it begins with a decision. You decide. You say, God, I'm all in. God, I'm not just going to listen. I'm not just going to know in my head what you've called me to. I'm going to decide, God, I'm all in. And once you decide that you're all in, once you determine that you're in, it leads to the first and most critical action step you take next, which is prayer or praying. You see, intentional influencers who want to influence their word for the Lord, for the Lord they pray for those who are far from God. It's part of their life. Prayer is simply talking to God before you talk, you talk to God about your friend or your coworker or your neighbor. You talk to God about them first before you talk to them or your neighbor or your friend about God. You talk to God first about them. Prayer is what opens the floodgates of heaven. It's where we acknowledge, God, I'm trusting you. It's not in my own power, my own strength, my own eloquence. God, I'm relying on my you, my heavenly father, to move and to act. And so, God, I'm coming to you in prayer. And I pray for those who are far from you. Romans chapter 10 says it this way. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. It's having a heart for those who are not yet saved. It's praying, as we see here, for those who are not yet saved. Man, if you don't already have it, I would encourage you to have a prayer list. If that's not a discipline or a practice in your life, I would encourage you to add it into your life. Some of you already have it. And, and who's on the list? It's simple. It's those you have influence with. Those you interact with, those you cross paths with, those you share life with and share proximity with. I would hope and pray that the first people on that list are your family. If you have kids or nieces or nephews or grandchildren, that man, you are praying for them and you are lifting them up. You have intentional influence with them. That they're on your list, that you're, they're also on the list are people you, you know, you interact with at the gym or, or people you interact with at the grocery stores that you regularly visit. Maybe the people at the activities of your kids or your nieces, nephews, or grandkids, they're on the list. Your coworkers, your customers, your clients. And you're also praying for those who give you grief. It tells us in Matthew chapter 5, pray for anyone who mistreats you. So we're praying for those that we have influence with. And as that becomes a discipline, a regular part of our life, because we're trying to tap into the power of God, as you're praying for them, notice what part of your prayer includes. Jesus goes on and tells his disciples in Luke chapter 10, verse 5, he says, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. You see, you want to be praying for God's peace, or in Hebrew, shalom, God's peace to be upon them. Why? Why would that be so important to be praying for peace? Because God's peace is powerful and it's life-changing. What do we learn in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7? It tells you and I that the peace of God, it transcends all understandings. And what does it do? It guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. People desperately need the peace of God, especially those who are far from God. And so when you pray for someone, and you're praying peace upon them, what begins to happen? You begin to develop a compassion for people. In fact, I just ask you, how do you see people who are not yet saved? How do you view them? How do you think about them? Do you see them as those people? Do you see them as enemies? I want us to think about this. How can we love someone in the kingdom of God when we see them as an enemy? God says, I love them. And just like I came to seek and save you, God says, I keep, came to seek and save them. Of course we hate their sin. 
Of course we hate the impact that sin has upon their life and the lives of others and, the li- and upon the world. But hating the sinner, that's not the heart of God, to which almost everybody, if not everybody, will say, well, pastor, I don't hate anybody. I don't hate them. Well, is it possible our behaviors, our actions, what we say about them, how we treat them, is it possible that we actually do by our actions, behaviors, words, and what we say that we actually maybe don't care for them? You see, by praying for those who are far from God, by praying blessings upon them, by praying for God's peace upon them, your heart is far more likely to have compassion towards those who don't yet know the Lord. Do you love or loathe those who are far from God? So where do we start? Man, we just start with, we decide to engage. I'm in. I'm in, God. I'm going to start praying. And if you're praying and you've been praying, keep praying for those who are far from God. But some of you, it's time to step in and engage and pray for those who are far from God. Pray peace and pray blessings upon them. Pray they get saved. Next, if you're going to be an intentional influencer, you're then going to try to discover their story. You're going to learn about their story. Everybody has a story. Everybody has context for the way they are, why they act the way they act. And when you begin to truly listen to who they are, who that person is in front of you that you interact with, and you listen to their circumstances and what makes them who they are and why they believe what they believe, man, your heart starts to move towards them. And you start to have compassion and love for them. Well, how do you discover their story? Jesus just was super practical in this passage. He says, it's simple. Notice what Jesus said to his disciples, Luke chapter 10, verse 7. He said, stay there. Duh. Stay there. Eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Don't move around from house to house. So Jesus said, stay. Connect with them. Spend time with those who don't know the Lord. Hang out with them. That's how you can eventually discover their story. That's how you can learn about who they are, what's important to them, what they value, what makes them tick. And as you do that, and as you listen and hear their story and their background, it makes your praying more personal and empathetic. And as you spend time building relationships with those who are far from God, As you spend time discovering their story, listening to them, asking questions about them, they will start to recognize that you care about them and that they matter to you. And you care about them not just as a convert, potentially, but as a person. And you see them. After you decide to engage through prayer, after you discover their story, because as Jesus said, you stay, you spend time with them, you hang out with them. Then as an intentional influencer, you're going to discern, hey, what's next? What's next? Now I can tell you this, I don't know exactly what is next for you in your situation, because you have your unique sphere of influence with the people you interact with. But what I can tell you is that you can be confident in the power of the gospel. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. The gospel is the power of God. And so you can be confident in that, not in yourself, but in God. You can be confident in what we read earlier in Acts 26, that God is using you to open their eyes to the love of God. You can be confident in that. And as you are discerning what's next, though I don't know what it is specifically for you, I do know that eventually it probably involves meeting some type of need. As you're discerning what God has for you next in this relationship, there's going to be a need you will have an opportunity to meet. Jesus goes on and tells his disciples in Luke chapter 10, verse 9, he said, heal the sick who are there. Because as you invest in others, as you stay so to speak, you hang out, you spend time with, you stick around when you know their story, when there's a level of trust that begins to develop with them, you will find that now that someone's trusting you, they'll start sharing their needs. Somebody, if somebody knows you care about them, that's when they get more real. And you know somebody's getting real with you if they share their needs. They might share how their marriage is struggling. 
They might share how there's an addiction in their life that they're struggling with. They might share about financial problems and woes that they're having. They might share about the challenges that they're having with their kids or the issues they're having at work. And here's what's incredible. That gives you now an opportunity to say something like this. Hey, I just want to let you know I've been praying for you ever since we met. But now, thanks for sharing that. And now that you've shared that specific, you know, situation, need, or whatever that's happening in your life, I just want you to know I'm going to start praying about that specifically for you. Now, I don't know if you've ever done that with people. Um, it goes differently with different people, right? I, there's a, one individual uh, who's on my prayer list. His name's Lewis. It's somebody I've met at the gym. And, and so this is part of my, my, my circle, people I connect with. And so I've started praying for Lewis. And as I started praying for Lewis and, and asking him questions and starting to discover his story and choosing to stay rather than just rush off and get to my workout. And so taking that time. And so as I discover more about Lewis and I hear his story and hear some of his struggles and specifically what's going on in his family dynamic, and as I, he's sharing that with me, um, I say, hey, Lewis, man, thanks for sharing that. Um, that's pretty heavy. And so I talk to him a little bit about that. And I say, hey, I've been praying for you uh, ever since we met. But I just want to let you know, I'm going to start praying about that. And his eyes kind of got big. You know, when he's like, uh, like, he, like it kind of didn't register at first. And then he realized what I said. And then he's like, oh, okay, thanks, thanks. Because think about it. No, think about people. They, who doesn't want prayer, right? Who, and anybody will take prayer. Of course they'll take prayer. And he kind of has that look on his face like, oh, okay. And so, and then I got to the point where I'm saying, okay, Lewis, you know what? Uh, if there comes a point or a time, man, uh, I'd love to connect with you. Uh, I just kind of my life and what, what, what my life revolves around, um, I kind of have some uh, experience in that. And maybe I could listen and maybe offer you some thoughts. And I'd love to connect with you. And uh, usually, I don't, I, Pastor Ben, I don't know how it worked for you, but, but usually I avoid bringing up that I'm a pastor as long as possible. I don't know if that's how you, maybe you lead with it. So, okay, okay thank you. Because if you disagreed, I'm not as holy as you, but, um, but uh, which is true anyway, but, but which is true anyway. But, but uh, I just don't lead with that because the, probably 80% of the time, as soon as they find out I'm a pastor, most 80% of the time, it's like that changes everything. And it just does. I don't know what it is. What, what, you know. But anyway, so I don't lead with that. In fact, I've always thought, I haven't pulled the trigger yet on this, but I've always wanted to tell someone, they say, what do you do? I want to say I'm a shepherd. <laughs> I got 1,000 sheep, 1,200 sheep or so. Most of them are awesome. Some of them are pretty ornery. I got a lot of sheep. I got a couple goats. No, no. <laughs> Building relationships, connecting with people, praying for people. And by the way, when you pray, when you intercede for someone, expect God to work. Expect God to move. Expect a miracle. Listen, I want you to think about this. The problems of those who are far from God are just miracles waiting to happen. God wants to move in the hearts of those who are far from him. So believe and expect God to move as you're praying for them. You meet a need, and that begins with prayer, but it's eventually going to include some type of action, doing something to help them with their needs. I talked to somebody after last service. Man, it was an incredible story, and, and, and he's, he's been connecting with this person who, who's far from God but, but kind of like is, is exploring faith, and, and they're in the later part of their life, and, and, and he's now been meeting with this person a couple times a week and going and visiting him, and I'm listening. I'm like, man, you're literally doing what we're talking about in this series. And he's like, hey, Chris, can you help me with this? And give me, just because I, 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 I don't have a problem sharing Jesus, but maybe you can help me with this part. And so I'm going to give him some information this week to help him. He's choosing literally a couple times a week to go get together with this person, to stay with him. And he's expecting God to work. He's expecting God to move and miracles to happen. And when you start meeting people's needs and caring for them genuinely, man, it moves their heart. It lets them know that they matter. It speaks volume to them. And as you begin to share more and more life with those who are far from God, you're going to eventually get an opportunity as an intentional influencer to deliver the gospel. Because that's what intentional influencers do. 
They deliver the good news about Jesus. Jesus went on to it with his disciples, and he said in Luke chapter 10, verse 9, he said, tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. You will get an opportunity to present the good news that God loves them, that God wants to have a relationship with them. The kingdom of God has come near to them. And you'll get that opportunity. 1 Peter chapter 3 says it this way. If someone asks you about your Christian hope, always, everybody say always. Always Always be ready to explain it. For those who have struggled with confidence in sharing your faith, for those who get intimidated because of a fear of, oh, I may not do it right and I may mess it up. Listen, I do understand that. And I want to let you know the best way to share the gospel, the best way to share the good news about Jesus is to share your own story. I want you to think about that. And let me just give you a couple practical steps here. The best way is to share the good news of Jesus is to share your own story. You start off sharing, hey, this was my life before I came to Christ. This is what it looked like. This is what I went after. This is what I focused on. This is how I tried to find fulfillment. You share what your life was like before Christ. Then you share, but but you know something? Here's how I learned about Jesus. Here's how I discovered that God loves me, that I'm far from him and I've been seeking him out in the wrong ways. And so you just share that, whatever that looked like for you, whatever issues you were going through, whatever you were struggling with and how God got you to the point where you finally learned about Jesus. And then you shared what caused you to respond to the gospel. That's your conversion story, your conversion experience. Was it like my wife, Heather, who was at a Billy Graham crusade and, 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 and she repented and gave her life there? Was it like me, who uh, my youth pastor shared the gospel with me, the good news, and I wasn't ready, and then my senior pastor came over and shared the gospel. They needed everybody they could to try to get me to get, come to Christ. And he shared the gospel with me. And there in our living room, at that uh, dining room table, or at the dining room, uh, the, the dining table, I gave my life to Christ. What is your, what does it look like? And then you flavor that with what actually happened. And then, perhaps most important, you share what your life's been like since you came to Christ. Because there's the good news in action. There's, that's what I used to be. But man, let me tell you about what my life's been like since I've been in Christ. Let me tell you about the joy I have. Let me tell you about the peace I have. We talked about the peace. That peace that doesn't make sense to a non-Christian. How can you and I have this peace that transcends all understanding, that, that allows us, even in the midst of trials and difficulties, that allows us to still find strength and still be at peace? How? That doesn't make sense to somebody who's far from God. And you share how the peace of God is watching over you and guarding you and protecting you. You share about the love of God. You share about how God's given you purpose, how God's changed your life. You share about the blessings that God has poured out upon your life. That's who I was, but this is who I am now. You share your story of how Jesus changed your life. Remember, 1 Peter chapter 3 said, always be ready, always be ready to share the hope that you have in Jesus. So man, I would encourage you, Know your story. Work on it. Take time on it. Communicate it with those you know and care about it. Write it down. Type it down. Type it out. And share it with your friends, your family, your small group. Let them uh, give input to it. Because again, you want to get better at it. You always want to be prepared with your story. And I would tell you this, your story is the greatest testimony to the power of God. Your story. You're like, not my story. Yes, you are lost and now you're found. And that story matters, and God will use your story to save another life. So what do you do? You decide to engage. I'm all in. I'm all in, God. I'm ready. And you're going to pray for those people that you have influence with. You're going to invest in them. You're going to stay. You're going to hang out with them. And as you do that, you're going to listen. You're going to discover their story and their journey. You're going to care enough to know them. And then you're going to discern, hey, what's next? What's next? And that'll eventually mean meeting some type of need or needs. And that genuine care and love that you have for them will give you an opportunity to deliver the good news about Jesus. And then finally, as an intentional influencer, you're going to invite somebody into a relationship with Jesus. You're going to take that step. People are lost. They need forgiveness. 
They need somebody who will look them in the eye that cares about them and tell them that they can be forgiven. They need somebody to tell them, look, we all fall short. We all sin. We all deserve to be separated from God for eternity. But God loved us so much that he gave us his only son that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but would have eternal life. And you can join the family of God. Would you like to do that right now? Jesus will come into your life. He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll give you the gift of heaven. He'll give you the gift of eternity, the gift of forgiveness, and you will join the family of God. Hey, would you like to pray with me right now and have God come into your life? Listen, that's something that God wants to use you to do to lead to someone else to Christ. And when you step in and give someone the opportunity to receive life, man, there's nothing more exciting knowing you're fulfilling your primary purpose and mission. Uh, real quick, some of you here, um, might this might interest you. In fact, I hope it'd be all of us eventually. If you'd like to be equipped to better uh, walk in what we're talking about today, to be an intentional influencer, we, for three weeks, we're going to have a three-week seminar starting April 23rd, so April 23rd, April 30th, and May 7th. It's called, and it's going to be during this third service, so you would come to a different service, and it's called How to Be an Everyday Missionary. Then we'll give you more information about it, but it's just like taking everything we're talking about today and expanding upon it and getting really helpful and practical how you can actually live out your purpose and your mission to be an intentional influencer for the Lord. I would invite you to be a part of that. We'll tell you more about it coming up. Last verse. I think this summarizes it well. Colossians chapter 4, it simply says in verse 5, make the most of your chances to tell others the good news. Make the most of it. God has given you so many opportunities and chances to tell others the good news. God wants you to thrive in life and in faith. And you can thrive in your life if you will join God in his redemptive plan. If you'll intentionally influence your world for the Lord Jesus by sharing. By sharing the good news that Jesus saves. And you'll thrive knowing that you're on mission. You'll experience an incredible joy knowing that God's used you to influence people's eternity. Is that you? Are you ready to join in? Are you ready to join God and step into your primary purpose and your primary mission to intentionally influence the world for Jesus? Let's pray about that now.